Can we avoiding elephants? Sharon, um, it's a psychological thing um, for both myself and for the elephant. Um, for the elephant, the, the psychology around it is, is simply that we become as big as the elephant. Um, and when you're on a level eye or eye level with an elephant, that's something that's quite scary for an elephant. So it's, it's, a, it's an intimidatory uh, tool that we use. Um, also, it gives us a barrier that we can move around that is not that easy for an elephant to move around. So it gives us a physical barrier that we can use to put between us and an elephant. Um, on the elephant's uh, side, um, they don't like to see humans or lions higher than what they are. And so it, it creates this, um, I'm not going to say it creates a standoff, although that's probably about the best description, uh, Sharon. It creates a, a barrier where they don't come past and we don't transgress. And because you're at the same level, it does add a certain intimidatory effect which stops the elephant from coming up and, and close to you, which is what you want out here. You don't want them to have the upper hand. <laughs> now, Hunter, you'd like to know why don't the, termite mound, the termites come out of the termite mound when we're standing on them, similar to ants do? Um, quite simply because termites and ants are completely different species to one another. Uh, termites are more closely related to cockroaches. Uh, ants are, of course, more closely related to bees and wasps. Now, the ant reaction to you on their nest is, a def is defensive, very similar to bees and wasps, whereas the, uh, the termites just retreat to safety underground. Their defense is this massively hard concrete-like structure that we're standing on at the moment. And so they would just retreat and cover tunnels up behind them and go deeper into the nest and therefore making it more difficult for any predator to get close to them. They don't need to chase them away. Um, so just two completely different uh, ways of protecting themselves, uh, Hunter. Although, as mentioned, they, uh, they do share characteristics with others. Right, now let's see if we can get closer to this elephant. It's going to take us about, I don't know, probably about five or ten minutes or so to figure out if we're going to be able to do it safely. We're going to need to do it quite quietly, so we're going to send you over to Brent and that elephant carcass where Hosanna is still in the vicinity, I hear. Well, Hosanna is still keeping a safe distance away and watching the hyenas and vultures squabble over the carcass. Now, uh, remember, this is 100% live, and if you have any questions for us, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can pop it on whatever feed you are watching, just on the chat section. So many hyenas. Now, Hassan is keeping his distance, and uh, Hokamuri has headed in the opposite direction. So, no, they wouldn't necessarily feed together, Kola. Uh, I think Hosana would run away if Hokamuri arrived here. Um, he is a, Hokamuri is a big threat to Hosana. Uh, as a general rule, he's a new leopard in the area. He's not related to Hosanna, so he would actually try to kill Hosanna. So I don't think they would feed together at all. However, if Tingana were to make an appearance, there is a possibility they might both feed. But I just think the number of hyenas that are currently at the, at the carcass are probably, is probably just a bit too much for even two male leopards. squawks and squeaks the hyenas are still acting quite cautiously uh, there's more hyenas coming in that's why there might be a fight here Let's 
listen to that audio. A very low-ranking hyena's arrived. <coughs> fighting there but it looks like a re relatively amic amicable entrance compared to some we've seen with hyenas that however hyena as soon as that one arrived this hyena moved away from the carcass sign is still watching all the hyena shenanigans intently <laughs> There's some more submissive and dominance displays going on. It's always interesting when you get large groupings of hyenas together. We've spent more and more time and more and more hyenas have arrived at this unfortunate elephant. A pearl, you are spot on. They are becoming more and more vocal and hyena vocalizations are incredible. Now, when it was fresh and they were trying to be sneaky, uh, they, they didn't make any noise at all. But as they've spent more time here, the lions haven't arrived, uh, they've become more and more vocal. Disappearing hyena. <laughs> now, Hassan is just watching intently. Uh, Marco, I do think it amuses him to some degree. It's it's entertainment, and young male leopards at that age really like entertainment. So he just likes watching what's going on. Oh, I almost expect a male lion to come charging in the way those hyenas scattered. They are very nervous around a carcass like this, just in case that very thing happens, that a male lion comes charging in. And they all come back. So one hyena sort of got a fright and ran, and all the rest followed. Now, spotted hyenas are one of the more intelligent and interesting animals. And the, yes, Shamsung, there's a lot of research that's being done on understanding of hyena calls in, in, different, in different areas. So there is research that is ongoing with that. Now, see... Especially when a lot of hyena heads are down like that and inside a carcass and they get a fright. Ooh. Don't run into me. <laughs> Sillies. Now that was a little bit of growling between hyenas that gave the fright. And as I was saying, when their heads are inside the carcass and they can't see what's coming, they tend to be even more nervous. Masana still just watching all this happening. And you see how they stop and look and make sure there's no lion on the way. Right, we're going to keep watching on what happens here. In the meantime, let us go see what the Inca Humas are up to. Well, I think it's now nap time again. It amazes me with lions. They were walking so purposefully and they were kind of head down, sniffing, and they were 
really walking fast and all of a sudden they reached this little point and decided that's it and they just all lay down and have flopped got down and are now decided i think this is where they're going to stay for the day it's it always amazes me with vines when they do this because you think like they're going somewhere and they really want to be somewhere and all of a sudden they just see a branch and they're like, oh that looks good let's just lie down there and so <laughs> they've kind of found themselves this little shady bush willow spot and everybody's getting in underneath it and trying to have a bit of a nap so I think that's going to be it in terms of activity from the Inca Uma Pride today. They've walked away from where the buffalo are as well. So it's not like the buffalo are going to come back in this direction. So it's going to be interesting to see how, like I say, how it all plays out. Also, what's happening is the sun is starting to come out and the sun's got a little bit of a bite to it. And that's maybe what's convinced them to lie down because they were kind of moving. And then they just decided when the sun came out that that's it. We're going to sit right here. But also another thing I've noticed with the Inkum is uh, watching them as they've been walking around is that they seem to have gone through a rough time, all of them. they All of them have got little cuts and scrapes and scars, even the sub-adults. So I wonder if maybe they didn't kind of been fighting amongst each other because they've been struggling to find big kills. Maybe that's what's been happening is that they have have a situation where... And they've been fighting amongst each other over, you know, small carcasses. And that's why there's little cuts around the eyes. Because two of the sub-adults have nasty little gashes under their eyes and around their eyes. And then there's lots that have got little scars on their necks and bum areas. And so it seems as though there's a little kind of altercations amongst them. Now, that particular one is looking as though it's taking it very easy on top of the termite mound almost like king of the castle at this stage so what i want to do is just try and position ourselves so we can actually see that one better because the rest are all so sleepy we're not going to get much out of them so let's just try and get round so we can actually see that individual a little better and what we can see it now and not have it just its tail and hopefully can get its head as well and shoulders there was another one that was facing us on that mound at one point and then just got up as you guys came back to us so it happens like that and i see there's also a lioness lying or sub-adult lying where i wanted to go but anyway we'll find a way through here and hopefully there'll be a situation where we'll get a nice little gap dave will have to tell me when he gets it. there we go that should be quite nice Bridget, no, I don't think so. That injury to that lioness's eye, well, if you're talking about the one that's got the little cuts as a... Oh, no, don't... <sighs> so, lion's getting off. Sorry, Bridget. I, basically, the, the thing is, if you're talking about the one that's got the little cut that we saw yesterday, um, no, she should be fine. Um, she should That should just heal up and her eye should be absolutely perfect. If we're talking about the, the lioness that's got that kind of glossed eye or that purplish colored eye yes her eye vision is probably severely affected by that and and probably in all likelihood wouldn't really be working very well but cats can still survive just as well on one eye they're still able to see well enough to hunt and to to be able to grab food that they need i've seen many leopards with one eye many lions with one eye it's a common thing and then they generally are able to kind of still do the job and, and find what they need and survive like that so they're all okay they're not going to be a situation where they're going to have a problem with their sight you'll just find that one is going to probably just have a bit of a sort of less sight than some of the others have got that's all they, but still effective enough to hunt and to to be able to find what they need now it seems as though everybody has found themselves a shady spot i don't think there's much happening there's amber eyes has just popped up her head she's looking as stately as ever behind the little termite mound and she really is looking good at the moment she's big and healthy and hopefully she'll be able to help with bringing down one of these buffalo a big buffalo and that this pride can feed off it for quite some time i was thinking about them and, and wondering if maybe 
the reason they're not on that elephant is not only because they're not just used to elephant meat, but maybe it's also a situation that they're a bit nervous of being on that carcass and, and some of the other males arriving. So you never know if the Avaka boys will arrive. The last big carcass they had that we know of was that buffalo in Buffalo's Hook, which they got chased off quite promptly. So it's maybe a situation that's why they're nervous to head back to this elephant carcasses because they think potentially they might get chased off it and risk the cubs or the sub-adult safety. And so that's maybe why they're a little cut and nervous. Good. Well, I think what we're going to do is we're going to leave the Nkumas now. They really aren't going to do much from here. The sun's come out and it is seriously warm when the sun is out. And so I'm pretty sure all of these lions are going to have a little nap and have a little rest now. I don't think they're going to move nearly as much as what they were earlier. And it's the grass is so long here that we really can't see too much of them anyway. So we'll probably leave them, let them have a good nap and then we'll try and come back this evening because I'm pretty sure these guys are going to be up again this evening and moving about. Now, while we do that and what, well, figure out where we're going to go from here, I believe Steph is still stalking that herd of elephants. We've actually given up on the stalk. I must admit that uh, I was following my gut with that elephant and there was just something that I wasn't happy with. Now, while I've been walking, I've been trying to analyze why I got that feeling. And, it, you know, over the years here, I've learned how to trust one thing. And that's if your gut's telling you you don't go there, then don't go there. Um, and for whatever reason, it could be a subconscious body language signal that I'm picking up on that elephant or vice versa or the conditions were just not right um, but nevertheless I've trusted my gut and we've uh, and we've moved off and uh, I'm leaving that elephant to peace and he leaving us to peace and that way we're just defusing the whole thing with uh, especially with dealing with with incredibly dangerous animals like elephant and lion and buffalo and rhino if you're not 100% comfortable with with that encounter you need to create distance and that is a universal law here from the tiniest insect and bird all the way through to the largest animal if you're not comfortable create distance and so that's what we've done now with the recent rains that we've had uh it's it's enabled a late flush of plants and one of the prettier plants that we have out here are these comelinas this is the indigenous african comelina um, as opposed to the blue one that you get here, which is uh, from India. Or it, it grows naturally here, but all the way from India to here. This one has a more limited range, I should say. It's probably the better description there. But don't you think that's just an absolutely beautiful flower? Have a look at these anthers and the reproductive parts of the plant with the male parts here. That is where the pollen gets distributed to insects coming to feed. And then the female parts of the plant, there, that is where the pollen gets delivered. And then we'll create the seed, which will then go on to make the rest. Now, I did hear from Elka up in Kenya. She was working for us as a camp manager up in our camp in Damara. And uh, she used, she is quite a holistic um uh, I don't want to say a person closer to the earth than, than what you'd usually find. And she used to use the juice that you find from these comelinas as eye drops in an eye bath. So these ones are a bit dry because it's late in the season. But generally speaking, if the seed wasn't there, you'd then push this capsule and a fluid would come out. A, not a very sticky fluid, but more viscous than water. And you'd then be able to use that as an eye bath and uh, a soothe uh, for your eyes if you've got an irritation in your eyes. I've yet to try it. I'm, I can't wait to find one to, to do. Now, I'm going to find something else interesting to show you, but um, Hosanna is now moving to the water from that elephant carcass, and so have a nice look. Good luck. Yes, he got chased by the hyenas. Uh, when they were chasing each other around, the hyena nearly ran over Hosanna. So he's up on the move again, heading back towards Twin Dams. There he is. Where are you off to now, silly? I'm just going to wait for him to disappear behind that bush. Then I'm going to shoot up towards the dam wall.
Got hyenas calling all over the place. Right, let's move towards the dam wall before he starts moving again. Now, leopards are capable of incredible speed, Mr. Zero, and are much faster than hyenas. Uh, hyenas are built for stamina, where the, it, the leopard is built for short bursts of incredible speed. I can hear hyenas calling. I'm just going to stop now. And there he is. Oh, he is so pretty. Is he going to go stare at his reflection? So, for those of you who might have joined us, we are 100% live following Africa's incredible wildlife. Uh, we're in South Africa at the moment and uh, we're following a young male leopard who's gone right below us. I can't actually see him. I think he's popping up now. Uh, so his name is Asana. We've been following him since he was a little cub. And apart from being 100% live, you can also ask us questions uh, through various different means. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can also ask us questions by just popping it on the feed you're watching, whatever feed it might be. Okay, let's move a little bit. Now, although he got, he just got chased by some hyenas uh, that are feeding on an elephant that died from its wounds from a big fight with another elephant. Now, Hassan is one of Hassan's favorite foods. Can't see him yet. And they're just on this side. There's a, a little herd of impala. There we go. So, if Asana gets the chance, where is he now? Just below us. Uh, he will definitely try grab one of those impalas, but it is quite uh, dangerous for him because there are a huge amount of hyenas around. So, even if he managed to catch that impala, the chances are the hyena would steal it from him before he had a chance to stash it in a tree. What are you pondering, little man? He is an absolutely gorgeous kitty. Now, I've been away from Juma for about a year, and uh, Hasana has grown huge amounts since I last saw him, Mimi. He's keep turning into a big boy. He's by no means near his full-grown size yet. I think he'll get a bit taller and he'll definitely start filling out as well. You can hear the battle happening at the elephant carcass behind us. Now he is a very relaxed little leopard. And uh, there is maybe the perception that he might be a bit friendlier than the other leopards, Sharon, but he's not. Uh, most young male leopards at this age are curious and fun and uh, are very tolerant of being followed. They actually almost seem to like the distraction. And uh, as they get older, a lot of those habits will will sort of fade away. Uh, if you look at quarantine, he, he had a very similar sort of personality to uh, Hosanna at the same age. I wonder what his plans are next. What are your plans, mister? Are you thinking about going after some impala? Uh, or are you going to go find a nice piece of shade to sleep in? Let's have a look. I'm just going to try to make it a little bit easier for Craig. Say when, Craig. 
That's good. There we go. And the cloud is breaking up, and we've just got this beautiful burst of golden light. And there isn't anything much better than a leopard in golden sunlight. He's watching a hyena on the other side of the water. There we go. That's what Asana was watching intently. A hyena in the distance. There's a couple, quite a few of them around. With that elephant carcass close by, There's this area is littered with hyena. Well, there's another one walking towards it. Let's see what happens between the hyenas. Okay, so the one that's moving quite quickly and doing the little dances, uh, the one closest to us at the moment, that is the uh, less dominant of the two. You can just see by the behavior. So that, 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 that sort of almost playful-like behavior is, is submission being showed, shown. You can see when hyenas get excited, they lift their tails like those two are doing. And here you can see his eyes are locked upon them. It's unlikely for the hyenas to come towards Hasana, especially with that mass of meat not too far away. Now, while we wait patiently to see what Mr. Hassani gets up to next, let's go back to Steph, who's playing detective. We are playing detective. We've got some good news for you. We've got uh, Tundi and Cubs tracks back on Juma again. This is Vulture's Nest Road, and we've got very fresh tracks of a little cub. Right there, just have a look at how tiny that track is. So I'll put my hands next to it for a bit of scale for you. That is tiny, tiny, tiny. There's the cub there. Now, I know that these tracks are fresh because you can see the disturbance. You can see how sharp the edges are, firstly. How incredibly pr pronounced the ridges are. And there's a breeze blowing, so you'd imagine that that would erode very quickly. You can see how sharp that ridge is at the point of that, that little grass there. Now that would erode very quickly with this breeze. And if we move a little bit further up the track, it gives us an even better timeline. Right here we've got a Franklin's, a do excuse me, a dove. A dove's track. Here's the dove's foot, the middle toe, and that is on top of the leopard track. So this is, this is no more than an hour or two old. So she's, she's back. Just a nice, nice puzzle to work out over here. She's walking in this direction. You can actually see where the dove landed here. And then walked on top of her track. So these two marks here are where the dove landed. Those are its back feet. So there's its back claw and back claw. It landed two feet down. And this mark that you see here, these ones here, are where the wings brushed the soil. And for that track to still be so pronounced, and on top of the leopard track, it happened now. So here the dove walked out here, on top of the leopard track, and off in this direction. It's quite nice. All right, let me see where she went. You're off to Tristan and an elephant. Indeed, we've got we've come to Bufuzuk Dam. We left the Nkuma Pride thinking that Bufuzuk Dam might be a good option. It's gotten warm all of a sudden, and you might find a few ellies that will come down towards the water. And pleasantly surprised that when we got here, 
there was an Ellie standing there and it's just kind of looking as though it wants to come towards the water. So I don't know where the rest of the, pr the herd is. There's a situation where it looks like the rest might be coming from the back there. Hopefully there'll be a nice herd that will come down and maybe have a little drink and a swim. There's not much else happening at Bifflesook Dam. The obligatory hippos are here at the moment. They're just taking it very, very easy. Obviously had a good night's feed and now back into the water and enjoying the fact that they are in water on a hot day like today and so that'll be quite nice to kind of see if the ellies come down and, and see if the hippos and tolerate their presence because sometimes the hippos get a bit funny about it now interestingly enough as i wonder where steph is actually i was i must try and get hold of him because we haven't seen a single sign of tundi and cub at all and so that fact that her tracks are around and very very fresh is really good news and so hopefully we're gonna have a situation where we'll be able to find her at some point hunter the roads are used extensively by not only us but animals as well the reason why is that you the roads generally are quite direct so they they run in a sort of straight line a lot of them and that means it's easy for the animals to get across things quite quickly the other reason is that there is no vegetation on there so you can imagine when a elephant or a lion or any of the animals are walking along and you've got grass hitting you in the face every five minutes a bush there and you've got to go around that bush and around this it's a lot more effort than just getting onto a nice clean road and just walking straight down the road. It's like us as people. If you walk anywhere and you see a nice pathway, you generally take a pathway as opposed to just walking through a thicket. And that's because it's just much easier to traverse. And so elephants like this are the exact same. They and, and all the other animals out here is that it's just much easier for them to get onto a road, walk nice and, and quickly on the road itself and get to wherever they need to go. But this elephant's behavior is really interesting. It's just kind of standing on the road there and you can see its trunk is out, it's sniffing and it just seems to be kind of taking everything in at the moment and what's wrong? Are you going to come this way to the water? obviously been in the water already look at the legs the legs are wet and so is the trunk now there was another vehicle here that i think came for their morning teas or coffee so maybe this elephant came down to drink and got sort of a bit nervous with that or it's come from one of the other dams around here there comes the little baby now and the rest of the herd is slowly but surely coming out of the tamboti thicket so it could be that maybe that sort of people being out to disturb them they've left now and so that's why the herd was kind of just waiting in the shade and now that the people have left they're going to start moving towards the dam itself it's interesting though she's definitely sniffing towards our direction her trunk is constantly turned in our way and she's just trying to pick up see look there we go you see how she just twists it just to be able to try and scent if we are still around she might still be picking up the scent of the people that were here earlier and she's just kind of working out is it safe for me to lead this herd to the water point and keep my babies down to the water so it's gonna be interesting to kind of see how long it takes her to decide that everything is okay the breeze is shifting from where we are towards where she is and so it's kind of the perfect sort of way of getting the scent of us she's downwind and that's maybe why she's a little kind of nervous now little one is going to say well if we're not gonna go for water then I'm going to have a drink so long while we're sitting here and is now tucking in to some nutrient-rich milk. Don't you love it when Ellie's put their trunks over their tusks like that? I, I always think it's very cool when you have the Ellie's kind of do that. It almost looks as though they're in the most chill mode that they could be in. It's probably just to take a bit of a weight off, but very cool. Convenient, isn't it? Just to have like your very own armrest, except I suppose it's still kind of pulling on your neck muscles it's not like it's an inanimate object that you sort of putting your trunk on but either way I suppose the tusks seem to do a good job because a lot of the bulls do it you see the bulls doing it very often they kind of put it over their trip their tusks and then walk like that nice to see it might also be that it's getting quite hot so they're just sitting in the shade at the moment and just taking it easy I would have thought they would have come to the dam a lot quicker than what they have or even if they are going to come here, maybe they've already finished drinking and they've just decided this is their resting point for the day is in this Tamberti thicket. And they're going to have a nice kind of relaxing time. I need to enjoy the fact that they've got, you know, food close by, water close by, don't need to move too much. It's sort of a good place for Ellie's to be.
Also looks like a very small herd. I can't hear any others coming through the thicket. Katrina, <laughs> no one is adorable, isn't it? I, there's very few elephants in this world, little baby elephants that aren't adorable. Baby elephants are one of those animals that really do kind of shine as a baby animal and, and, and evoke massive amounts of oohs and ahs and cuteness overload. So I do find that I always enjoy watching little baby elephants. So that one's starting to get quite big now and soon going to be too big to be suckling. And so it's not going to be called a little baby in a few years' time. It's going to start being a little sub-adult that's going to be walking around. But the funniest are the little tiny, tiny baby Ellie's when they're still a bit wobbly and they can't run. That's when they're at their cutest phase and there's still a bit of hair on them and their ears are a little pink and they kind of charge about chasing things, their trunks out of control. They, that's when they're at their best. Right, now our Ellie's are very stationary and not doing much, but Brent is still with Hosanna and sounds like he's up and about. Oh, he's chasing hyenas, he's chasing scrub hares. Hold on, let's keep up with him. It's all just happened. He was stalking a hyena and then the hyena disturbed the scrub hare and then he took off after the scrub hare and I'm not sure where he's gone. So he was playfully stalking. I thought he was going to jump on that hyena, give the hyena a fright. Uh, one hyena sort of came out by itself. But then the hyena disturbed the scrub hare right in front of us and he took off after it. But we've lost sight of him now. There he is. Uh, the scrub hair escaped. He's coming back towards us. Where are you off to, mister? So that scrub hair had a very lucky escape very rude awakening to the morning initially woken up by a hyena and then chased by a leopard oh look how close he is to us he's coming right next to us Obviously, the scrub hair disappeared somewhere in that direction by the fact that he is heading back there. I need to turn around. There we go. Are you going to go back to stalking hyenas, mister? So very, very lucky scrub here. He might just flop down in the shade now he's tired. Oh, shame. Scrub hair got away. The hyena just stood there bemused as he sprinted past it. And he's found himself a nice little shady spot now after all that exertion. Okay, well, let's see if Hassana gets up to any more mischief. Uh, in the meantime, let's send you back to Tristan with Ellie's about to go have a drink. It goes hand in hand. He's always up to something, so I'm sure he will get up to something again. But our Ellie's are just starting to have a drink. Interestingly enough, we also had squirrels and Franklin start alarm calling right here. And so I wonder if maybe something's moving about in the thickets. It could be a bird of prey. It could be anything really at this stage. But our Ellie's are just gliding past it seems like one female and her offspring that are coming past us and they're very kind of nervous as they were kind of coming down to the water slow slow approach and checking <laughs> so rod mccurdy your daughter is having a sleep in this morning she's having the morning off after a long stint of driving every single day we thought we better give her the morning off as you know she can sometimes get a bit grumpy if we don't give her her morning sleep and so it was better for the sanity of all of us to make sure that uh, miss mccurdy had a little nap this morning and made sure that she was uh, in fine fettle and a good mood for the rest of the day no I, she's just she's worked hard for a while now so 
we thought that we'd give her the day off and, and or the morning off and, and let her have a break. She's been at work longer than Brent and I have in this particular little cycle, and so it was a good idea. So she's around camp, I believe, chasing baboons around because baboons got into the to the camp this morning and stole the cookie jar that David made. And so David's very upset because all of his cookies have now been stolen and the baboons have eaten all of them. And so Taylor's been... Yes, well, he didn't make the jar, Rebecca, but he put the everything in it. He went to the effort to have a cookie jar, which is which is good. And so, anyway, Taylor's been trying to keep those uh, baboons at bay, and sounds like she's been having a bit of a nightmare with them. And I, I luckily did see the baboons leaving camp earlier when I was tracking the Inkuma, so hopefully she's had a bit of rest since then and is taking it easy. Now, Dave, I know the elephants are drinking, but can you come onto the dashboard here quickly? Because we've got a very cool little spider that is sitting running along the dashboard. No, don't run. Stay where you are. Because I see you eyeing out my hand to jump on it. Now, this is one of the Salticidae or jumping spiders. And they have very good eyesight. And so what they do is they'll try and see a target that they can jump onto. And then they basically have a hydraulic system in their legs where they pump fluid in very, very quickly. And that causes a massive amount of energy to be transferred. And they push it into... There you go. You see it jump onto the steering wheel? How cool is that? Isn't it very cool? I love jumping spiders. They're amazing, that little creatures. So it's now jumped onto the steering wheel with its web cast and is going to probably spin a web on my steering wheel, which is absolutely delightful. They love to do this, and so I'll have to stop it at some point before it gets too far gone and decides to do too much. But our Ellie's are still just having a little quiet morning drink. It's such a small herd. It actually doesn't even sound like Ellie's are drinking. Normally when we have Ellie's at this water hole, there's just thrashing about and, and there's noise and there's lots of rumbles and, and those kind of things. But this morning, these guys, just because there's the three of them, it's all very, very peaceful at the moment, which is quite nice. Our Franklin is not very happy, though. It's still alarm calling in the thicket over here. So I'll go and have a little investigation as to what's going on. You never know. Maybe Tundi's walking somewhere right here. So variety, no, not that common for elephants and hippos to fight over water. Generally, the hippos know the elephants are so much bigger that they just have to give way and leave the hippos to do, uh, leave the elephants to do their thing. Also, they know that the elephants don't stay long. So even though they drink and they kind of mess around, they won't be there all day. And so normally they just give way to the ellies for a while and let them go. The only time it becomes a bit of a competition is when water becomes scarce and it becomes quite confined. Then you'll find that the um, the hippos might get a little bit more aggressive, as will the elephants. They kind of compete for that water source, and then there's a lot more aggression between them. Um, and also, if maybe it's a mother with a little baby um, of either species, they sometimes can get a little kind of aggressive or testy with each other. So it just depends on the situation and, and who's around and who's involved in it. Good, but I think I'm going to go just quickly check on this Franklin because where Rex and Steph were with those Tundi and Cub tracks, it's heading in this general direction. So who knows, maybe Tundi and Cub's right here and we're just sitting here and we might have them. So they just off the damn wall is where the Franklin is alarm calling. So I just want to go and have a quick look there. And so while I do that and the Ailies move off, let's send you back the relaxed Hosanna who's just having a little break in the shade. Well, after all his exertion, chasing hyenas, chasing scrub hares, he is now having a snooze in the shade. He hasn't moved since you were last here. But, of course, the thing about Hasana is he does move a lot during the day. Uh, and he gets bored, I think, and goes off on little missions. And his head's starting to get very heavy as the temperature starts rising. And it's, it's risen quite, quite a lot. I'd say we're probably sitting at around 30 degrees Celsius, maybe a little bit less now already at 8, 8.30 in the morning. I think by this afternoon it's going to be a scorcher. I think we might hit uh, mid-30s, 35, 36 degrees today. That cloud cover's moved off and uh, the sun is burning bright at the moment. Not that it, never, it, does, it always burns bright, it's just we can't see it sometimes. Uh, he's not starving, but he's, he could definitely eat if the opportunity arose. And all predators, are, of course, are opportunists. Now, 
Jared's buddy is saying that Hassan has got a waterhole named after him. I didn't know that. Uh, maybe it's just a joke amongst the guides, uh, but I don't know of any waterhole that's named after Hassana. Maybe Final Control can help me out, yeah? <laughs> so, as I say, it's not an official name. Um, it is the second dam in the Twin Dam. Uh, so there's that small little catcher, catcher dam below the Twin Dam's wall where Hosanna and Shongile were seen frequently hunting terrapins when they were younger. But uh, it is not uh, officially named after him. I think people might just have nicknamed it. So it is not an official name. Poor tired kitty. Oh, there we go. Flat cat now. Now, but very exciting news in the leopard department. The fact that Tandy and Cub have possibly returned. Uh, I know Tristan and Steph are both in the area trying to follow up, so fingers crossed. Now, Let's go see how Steph's search for Tandy is going. Um, we actually called off the search for Tandy, not because of any other reason except for the fact that she headed off towards the Mowati drainage line into some thick bush. And if we walked in there, we were going to chase her out. And I would very much like for Tristan or Brent or Taylor to show you Tandy this afternoon. So we got a general direction of the tracks. They were very fresh, as you saw from the last time you were with me. Uh, she headed off towards some shade in the thicket area. And a leopard almost always during the day will hide up in a thicket. And we, we don't want to scare Tandy away too much. So we backed off and we'll let the guys in the cars finish the uh, finish the search for her this afternoon ah here we've got a tortoise that's just had a drink <laughs> how cool is that we're actually tracking this guy i thought it was a terrapin but it's actually a tortoise and he's just come down for a drink finished his drink and is now on the way back to eating some grass and some forbs again this is of course the hinged backed tortoise and you can see just from all the mud on this poor thing's face that it's been in for a rough time getting here now I learned an interesting thing the other day what is it for the life of me I can't remember it Taylor taught to me about these hinge back tortoises that they will eat millipedes now as far as I knew, and this is like, like I'm saying, two decades worth of, of field guarding, the only thing to eat millipedes was scorpions and civets. But I was taught that, uh, that, that these hinchback tortoises are very good at eating millipedes, in actual fact, favorite. And they quite often their dung is full of millipedes. I never knew that at all. I'd never even read it anywhere. Wow, you dirty. Did you fall into the water? Are quite blonde feet. That is so cool. <laughs> I love they, they they got back legs that resemble elephants' back legs. And you know when you look at the back legs of an elephant, it always looks like they've got saggy pajamas on. It's the same thing with a tortoise, in that uh, it always looks like they've got some saggy pants on. Another quite interesting thing around this pan is the fact that We've got some, ah, talking about saggy pants animals, we've got Tristan with some bigger saggy pants animals to show you. I do have, I've got a lot of them, a massive herd, in fact, that is busy crossing the road at the moment. So far, I've seen probably at least 30 individuals go over the road and more are coming out as we speak. Hello. Good morning to you too. Yes. 
it was a boisterous welcome to the sighting from one of the little ones but you can see look at how many elephants are spread in there it's just gray bodies moving around in mass through this area and I don't think this is what upset the squirrels or the Franklins. That was a little bit further behind us, but there was a whole bunch of squirrels and Franklins making a lot of noise. So I'm sure there's something here. It's just a matter of trying to find. You can see even the eddies are sniffing about. They've got their trunks up, some of them. Just trying to take in scentfuls of air and work out what's happening around here. But it's a big, 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 big herd. And so it makes me think that maybe, just maybe, this is Fang's herd that we're with. Because Fang's got one of the biggest herds here, and I'm a little excited about that prospect because I haven't seen Fang, like I say, since May last year, since we had that epic sort of encounter with her where she was, you know, up and down all over the place and on her own. And so I was hoping, just maybe, just maybe, that she's here. I haven't seen her yet, and I've been looking at all these big adults, but it seems as though none of the ones on this side of the road are any of her well any of those are hers so we'll have to just kind of see i see there's a couple of big ones still on my left hand side but they're quite obscured at the moment so there's some that are kind of coming through but none of them are fang that i can see so maybe we've just got another massive herd in the area that's where the rest are coming from is that direction now katrina you are like me and thinking this might be fang's herd and well, I don't know. It's difficult to say. Very, very difficult to say because can't see the entire herd. There's some that are, we had already crossed before I got here. And so I couldn't see whether or not all of them were out and about. And if she was here, I didn't see her though in the ones that did cross the road. And so maybe she's still somewhere here, but it looks like her herd. It's this kind of big grouping. And I haven't seen any other big herds on Juma other than her herd. And now is one of our big bulls coming along. Isn't he a beautiful fella? massive individual Susie there are approximately no I'm joking I don't I have no idea how many herds are in the area at the moment depends on weather conditions depends on a number of different factors but I mean, it's, it's, like I say it's every day is different for us but in terms of of kind of herds that we've been seeing regularly at the moment it's probably about three or four different herds that we're seeing regularly and that will change you'll find that the big herds then move off and another big herd will come in and it's it's very random as to how many elephant herds we can have in this area at any one time rabbi is very 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 difficult to identify every single elephant that we get out here potentially we could have 18,000 different animals coming through here and to memorize 18,000 and the way that they look when they're babies and things like that is going to be exceedingly difficult i don't think it's even actually really that possible but normally there's some individuals that we recognize and so fang is an individual that has this prominent tusk that grows back towards her body and is massive and grows basically the wrong direction and so that's why she's very easy to recognize then there's others that have very sort of interesting shaped tusks or big tears in the ears so daryl for example who's a big male that we see here has got that bell shaped hole in his ear it's a perfect little bell that he's got in his ear um they're around so it just depends on the different individuals but the best way is sort of notches on the ears that's normally your best sort of go-to source and then from the notches on the ears to the tusk shape and that will give you a good idea of exactly who these elephants are and which elephants they are so that's how they id them when they do these identification kits for elephants but it seems though most of them are just getting into the shade i want to just reverse back quickly tammy the matriarch doesn't always stay in the front middle or back it, it doesn't position within the herd generally you find they stay up front when the herd is moving so as to give the herd direction and try and help them get into the right places um, and be able to find the food and water and all the other things that they need to survive but you know it depends in a situation like this when they spread out to feed then the matriarch can be back middle sides front it doesn't really matter because everyone's kind of spread as they feed but once they start moving normally matriarch comes towards the front end now I'm apparently i'm describing a hairstyle thanks rebecca i it's really what i was going for is that it's called the elephant cut and it's you know back front and sides it's uh, just you know you do with it what you want but our ellies are not really visible and they're in deep, deep Tamburti thicket. So I think we're going to leave them there. I'll try and come back later this afternoon. I don't see any more big adults on my left. So Fang is here. She must have already crossed 
into that thicket and we must have missed her but i don't see any other big elephants on my left hand side no nothing there there's a few other young ones in this area and i can tell you one thing is that it is amazing how hot it's gotten all of a sudden we started this morning and it was very chilly it was cold there was a bit of a kind of nip in the air and now the sun has come out and it is absolutely blazing davi is it hot Smoking hot is what Darby says. It is very warm in the sunshine. So I'm quite grateful that these alleys, the ones that are actually visible, are where we can park in the shade. Because poor Jigger, we know, has an issue with uh, temperature control. And so, you know, we can't park Jigger in the sun too, too long. Otherwise, the sound goes a bit funny. Anyway, we'll kind of see where these alleys go. Maybe we'll still be with them. Maybe we'll have to leave them if they carry on into the thickets. But while we do that, let's send you for one last time to Steph on a bushwalk. Our ladies are beautifully temperamental, aren't they? And I'm, by ladies, I'm referring to Wendy, Jigger, and Rusty, of course. And they each have their own delightful personalities. And of course, uh, as uh, as you know, uh, they want to do, they change their personalities from time to time. And right now, Jigger is absolutely not enjoying the late summer sun. At least not as much as I've enjoyed it today. It's been a fantastic walk today. It really has. Those clouds that blew in just now, remember when it went all grey? Uh, you can see not a cloud in the sky anymore. It's a blazing hot day again. And I'm sure lots of things are going to happen between now and this morning. Now why I came here was because these guaris are starting to go ripe. You can see here. This is the fruit of the magic guari tree. Now you get fruit that comes out early in the season. You get fruit that comes out late in the season. And the guaris are one of the treats that come out late in the season. And you just take it and just like that, pop them into your mouth. And they got the most deliciously sweet taste. Hmm. The outer covering can be, a, you can see that they've got a type of fur on them which you have to rub off. But the fruit, if I break it open with my nail, so that you can see there's quite a lot of fruit on, uh, on that seed. Of course the dispersal mechanism is birds, so thin seed, big fruit, uh, big nuts at least anyway, thin, small fruit, juicy, meant to rub against one another in the crop of a bird, and you consume, and then you spit them out, and the seeds are then distributed like that into the ground where they will become the next generation of quarries. All right, that's me for today. You're off to uh, to Brent, who's also making his way through to some breakfast. What are you seeing, Craig? Craig, oh, oh. Well spotted where it's going to land. There it is. Craig spotted a little owlet. And I know why Steve, uh, sorry, I've got completely confuddled. I actually thought Craig had spotted a snake there because Craig really likes snakes. But uh, I know why Steph is eating, uh, what is it, a little pearl spotted? Yes, yeah, a little pearl spotted owlet. Why Steph is eating, eating grass seeds um, while he's eating grass seeds and guari berries after that comment um, about the woman in camp being temperamental and his quick attempt at saving uh, I think he's too scared to come to breakfast so he's trying to stock up on his way home now we left Hasana sleeping uh, and we let the other vehicles come in to get a chance to view him so he should be around there this afternoon uh, just quickly Hukamuri has crossed back into uh, Juma around uh, Impala Plains and the Torchwood Pride apparently have three tiny new cubs. So that's the update. Uh, so hopefully there's going to be lots of action on the Sunset Safari. Now I'm going to go enjoy my breakfast without evil stares across the table from the woman like Steph.